so welcome. Um, first of all, I want to thank the national team for representing us so well in Australia and for that wonderful safety talk on uh, things of safety in, at the, the worlds, I guess, sorry, would be where you were. Yeah, that was pretty amazing. Um, two two mid-airs. Yeah, ouch. Um, I, I did want to highlight though what was said when, um, when you were talking about that and you said, I was really depressed after that. And, and I started, I thought I'm going to open with that quick video because it was referenced. And when we talk about, you know, driving, soaring, and, and, and increasing it, et cetera, um, what sells? Like you watch that ad. That's a sexy ad, right? It's, it's you know, and, and you, you, you look at that ad and you watch the flying in that and you think, oh my God, was that unsafe? And likely it was some CGI, some camera angles, some, some trickery of photography, as Sylvain will attest. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm sure they did a lot of good safety elements in that, but here's what's the exciting, it's, it's, it's sexy, it's appealing, right? So as I was sitting here listening to our morning sessions, I wrote a note in my book about, you know, how can we make safety sexy, right? How can we make soaring sexy? How can we make it attractive and yet, yet, yet still make sure that we make it home at the end of the day? Um, so we tried it for years to make sex safe. Say, yeah. <laughs> well said. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just get everyone to give a moment to get their brains back into the room. All right, good. Um, so my opening thought this year um, was a quote from Aristotle. Excellent is, excellence is an art won by training and habituation. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. It is not, safety is not a destination, it's a journey. It's something that we have to continually do. We have to as long as we are flying, as long as we are driving, as long as we are alive on this planet, it is something that we need to continue. And it, it, it's not like we've, you know, we've arrived, we've done it. Um, and I think this is part of the reason why we're seeing the accidents and the fatalities with the more senior pilots. Because it's easy to fall into those habits. It's easy to fall into the, the, you know, the, the bad habits. And of course, we put, we put measures in place against this such as our spring checks, such as sessions like this, such as the required recurrency training that we do. Um, last year, when I gave my, my annual safety talk, I titled it, We Had a Lucky Year, because we had some very close calls. We had some things that when you read the incident report, should have finished, or not, not should, often finish with the word fatal. This year, our luck ran out a little bit. So this year we did have a loss of control in the circuit resulting in one death. Now, with our advanced aircraft, with our advanced technology that we have, we have more data than we used to have. So when we would have these fatal accidents, we would come out of them going, well, you know, we had one person who happened to glance over their shoulder and notice the attitude of the airplane moments before it hit. Now we have second by second telemetry, um, pretty much our, our own version of the black box. So we're going to be taking a look at some of that data. But the reality is we still don't know what happened because we have that, that, that piece of data that's inside um, the gentleman's head, which, which we don't have that telemetry on. But we will take a look at the data that we have, and then we're going to pose some questions to you and ask, you know, what, 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 what would result in that? What would cause that, that type of actions? And what can we do as pilots to, to not go there? Um, when we look at the, this year, we had our one accident, uh, our fatal. We had three gliders and one motor glider destroyed. Okay, so when we talk about the insurance rates. Now, um, this is going back oh, 20 or so years. We had a serious issue with insurance in Canada. And I know there's lots of controversy around, you know, SAC versus private and rates and all of that. But the reality was we had such a bad record that the insurance company walked away from us. And it, it was some very hard negotiations on the representatives our representatives at the SAC boards who even got us insurance, let alone cheap insurance. So we need to be cognizant of that because if we keep writing off four, five, six gliders a year and we have some heavy payouts because we we're talking about the whole liability versus hull loss piece, it doesn't take a lot and all of a sudden we're going to you know, put ourselves out of business. So we want to be cautious of that and be cognizant of that. And we've got some really pretty toys. Uh, my wife is very happy that I chose gliding of all the aviation sports because she reckons that they are flying works of art. They're gracious. They're, they're gorgeous. They're, they're, they're beautiful. 
Let's not break them. Um, several gliders were seriously damaged. There were two trips to the emergency this year. Ironically, both of them were involved in ground handling. So our safety is both on the air and on the ground. And we want to be, be cognizant of that because it's not only injuring and damaging the ship, but the contents of the container. I love that, that analogy, by the way. Thank you. The, con the, the package. Thank you. Yes, the contents of the package. Um, Again, this year we had another elevator not connected. Like seriously, folks. Who would, who would prefer to lose the rudder over their elevator? Who would prefer to lose an aileron over their elevator? Like seriously, without the elevator, you are not flying. We can, we can you know, secondary effects of controls, we can compensate the other two, right, to some extent. Granted, yes, we are gonna be diminished in our, in our capacity. Elevator is it. And again, we got lucky on that one, because he, he realized what was going on, released early, landed safely, should never have taken off. And we know, I mean, we, we come to these sessions, we sit here in a comfortable chair and say, yeah, I know, but it's still happening, right? Um, we also had two tow plane upsets this year. And again, lucky, because they didn't develop. Um, one was in a boxing the wake, and the second one, um, tow plane waved, Dove and turn left, glider hadn't released yet. Yeah, ended up in a stall uh, in Sipian Spin. Fortunately, he was at altitude, so he released the rope and recovered, and in both incidences, they landed safely. But we want to be questioning now about, you know, how does that develop and how does that occur, right? In my career as flying, I've had one incident where um, the tow plane thought I had released and did the, the dive left and <laughs> quick on the draw on that one. Um, so my theme this year is vigilance. As I've said already, safety is a, is, a, is a journey, it's not a destination. We do not arrive when it comes to the conversation of safety. It has to be continuous, it has to be ongoing. Now, when people ask me, you know, is flying unsafe? Is it, is it inherently more dangerous? My answer is no, it's not any inherently more dangerous, but it is less forgiving. Because driving here, I'm sure many of us made some minor mistakes. Ones that, you know, if we did in an airplane, might have not worked out so well. Driving's a lot more forgiving. Flying is less forgiving. A small, subtle mistake, and as we saw in, in Luke's video, and dude, I want a copy of that. <laughs> um, as we saw in that video, it's like, oh man, like just a momentary. Yeah, so fantastic. <laughs> and it goes back to my Aristotle quote, we are what we do. Okay, so, you know, the most dangerous part of the of the vehicle is the nut holding the wheel, right? So we're going to take a look at the stats. We're going to take a look at uh, selected. Uh, we'll take a quick look at the accidents. We're going to have a, a little bit more of an in-depth conversation around the fatal. And then we're going to take a look at the highlights of some of the incidences. And then we're going to have a, a conversation because um, we've got a lot of really good people here. We've got a lot of really good experience here. And I want to have a conversation with you around what are we going to do about this and how are we going to fix this? So from an accident perspective, uh, we had nine accidents. Now, I actually put the um, year over year on this one. And oh, yeah, I wanted to thank all of the safety officers, all of the CFIs, and all of the supporting people who volunteer their time at the clubs because um, we're now into year two of our three year safety program. Year one, which coincided with my taking this job, we had 100% reporting on safety reports that year, which I think is the first time. In a long time. Let's, let's leave it at that. Uh, this year, we were almost 100%. There was just one or two um, that weren't. I think actually the one that wasn't was Boncher, and they basically reported that they didn't fly this year. So we pretty much had 100% this year as well. Now, the safety audits, not quite as good, but we're still in the, I think we're around 80. We're in the, we're in the high 80s, low 90s, some, somewhere in there. I don't remember the exact numbers because I did have a couple roll in uh, a little bit later. But when we look at the stats, uh, in 2000. Five, uh, 15, we had 19,155 flights, we had 19,668 flights. So we have two years that are very, very similar. Right, almost the identical number of flights. Uh, good news is our accidents were down a little bit, number of reported incidents was about the same. The bad news, of course, is one of them ended up in a fatal. We're good? There's no statistical difference. Exactly, yeah, that's, and that's my point. Right, we're, we're kind of the same. The one, the one difference between the two is that we had a fatal this year and we didn't last year. 
right? Which, of course, is, you know, we say, well, okay, yeah, but the system, we, we got to fix this, right? So we, we, got, to, we got to do some stuff there. Say again? Were there any injury accidents in Injury accidents. Um, Yeah, I don't think so. My what? We did have the elevator not connected, but um, yeah. Uh, oh, in that 2014. Yeah, so 2000, I think you're asking about 15. Yeah, at 15 there was no one going to the hospital. We didn't have any deaths. We didn't have any serious injuries. Um, yeah, so you know the statistical says well the numbers and the the rates were the same, but you know we had a little bit more more stuff happening. Airmanship predominated in the uh, accidents and incidences. Um, and then, of course, the two were, were ground handling. So when we look at the accidents from a, from a causational perspective, it goes back to the classic story. And we need to, we need to make this not the classic story. Right? This is about airmanship. Uh, maintenance is really starting to, to show as, as, a, as a growing issue. We have an aging fleet. We have a fleet that is getting more and more complex. There's more stuff there. There's more things to go wrong. We were talking about the, the flarms and, you know, like what's the maintenance on them and how do we install them correctly and, um, you know, clubs are getting into, you know, more and more of that type of technology. Um, a lot of these were, were battery issues and power issues. We had a, you know, a battery short circuit and caused a small fire. Fortunately, the circuit breaker popped in, fuse blew, um, you know, batteries going flat, that kind of thing. Excuse me? Yeah. Does it mean uh, that you then now refer to the uh, pilots are distracted by uh, and And that's another consideration possibility. And we're going we're to explore that when we get into our conversation piece. Uh -huh. Absolutely, yeah. So the whole concept of pilots being distracted. And I love the comment Stephen made when we were talking about flarms. Are we training our pilots to this new cockpit that we've put in front of them? Mm -hmm. Right? Now, I'm, I'm over 30 years flying. Um, we didn't even have a radio when I got my license. Right, because I flew with the cadets and we didn't have a radio. All we had was the, the very basics, right, including that good old compass. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when we look at um, runway incursions, airspace, and near misses on the incident side, we're looking at 32 there. Uh, we're seeing a lot more stuff happening, you know, where we're having heavy metal getting close by. And that's not just SOSA. That's not just the corridor. Right, we're seeing that in other parts of the country as well. It's, it's busy airspace out there, folks. We need, we need to be visible, we need to be vigilant, right? We, we, we need to, to you know, think about what we're doing. Accidents phase of flight, no surprise here, landing. Um, but we're seeing two in the ground handling category. Okay, uh, one of them was a dropped airplane. Uh, airplane was taken out, someone had forgot the battery inside, took it out, took the battery out, fuselage fell over. You know, so we, we get into sometimes um, and when we look at that one and uh, the other, actually both ground handling ones, these were very old technologies. So this was a, the, the one where the fuselage fell over was a K-6, took the airplane out of commission for the entire season because it happened right in the beginning. Um, the, the, it was an old K-6 trailer that doesn't have a cradle. So you got to kind of you know, manhandle the fuselage until you get the, the rig that holds it upright while rigging. And you got that transition period between the two. And, uh, you know, we, you sort of, we, we tend to accept things that aren't necessarily the best way to do it. The other one was a, um, it's like a pry bar with wheels, right? So you stick it under the main wheel of the glider and then you pry it and then you can move it around in the hangar. Well, the airplanes got heavier. They got bigger. So you used to be able to pick up, and this, this device has been being used at that club for over 20 years. So you used to be able to do this and pick a glider and move it around. Now you've got to get a good 220 pound guy like myself to get your feet off the ground and sit on this thing. And he lost his balance and it sprung up and clocked him. <coughs> Sent the guy unconscious to the hospital. Um, but we, we tend to do this. And I'm guilty as charged. We tend to do this. We get into a way of doing things then we sort of justify it and we don't you know, take a step back and take a critical look and say, should we be changing this and fixing it? It kind of works. Right? And I know at my club, I, we've had a couple of minor things along the way where We've had some damage to the airplanes because, oh, it kind of works. And if you do it just this way, this is right, it, you know, yeah. So maybe we need to take a step back once in a while and say, let's, let's take a look at that. And that's the purpose of doing the audit. This is why we want you to be doing audits periodically, right? And, and the, the reports. Again, runway incursions, airspace incursions, seeing lots of those. Okay. 
Now comes the, the difficult conversation. Um, whenever there's a, a fatal accident, people always like to speculate. So what we're not going to do today is speculate. We're going to look at the facts. Then we're going to ask ourselves what might cause those facts. But more importantly, we're going to talk about what can we do to prevent us, our friends, our fellow pilots from getting into those situations. So here are the facts. He planned a half hour sniffing flight. He flew for four hours. He carried 750 milliliters of juice and four snack bars. He consumed 350 milliliters of juice, so he had two juice bottles, he drank one, and ate one snack bar. This was his third flight in the ASD 29. Uh, from an experience perspective, he had just under 500 hours of power flight, spread over about 30 years, and he had a little less than 200 hours in a glider. So that paints the picture of our, of our pilot. The flap setting was undetermined, because the first question that comes to mind with this, when we have a stall spin with a flapped airplane, was what were the flap <coughs> settings? Why am I asking about the flap settings? Who flies flap ships? Talk to me. Wash in. Yeah, Wash in. Stall spin, what happens in a stall spin when your flaps are out? Not good. Not good. <laughs> yeah, so you read the manual on this, and it's, you need to retract the flaps to get her out of the spin. Okay. So, you know, what were the flap settings? Right, he was in the circuit. In fact, he was on the base leg. Again, more facts. It was a challenging day. It was moderately gusty. The winds at the time of the accident were 310, 10 to 12 knots. Um, they were 340 degrees, 24 knots at 3,000 feet. So we've got a, a, not a bad difference in, well, twice the speed. And I, I heard a couple of you say it, shear. We're going we're gonna to explore wind shear a little bit today. Okay. Um, runway was runway 23, but I want you to take a look at this number here. You get 5,000 feet of runway. Now I know there's a, a, a lot of concern around carrying that extra speed in a, in a hot ship when you're coming into land. And we actually have one of our glider write-offs because the person was trying to put it on the numbers when he had 4,000 odd feet of runway in front of him. And in that, in that desire and that drive to be you know, on the numbers, he ruined, a, he ruined an airplane, right? A, an old instructor of mine used to say it's, it's better to, to push the glider backwards than carry the pieces forwards, right? Uh, the first time I flew out in, in, the, in BC at Pemberton, uh, the instructor who checked me out, he was a British guy, and he was very much, I want you to land right on the numbers. Well, just behind those numbers were boulders. <laughs> And the owner of the, the airport, uh, Rudy, uh, he said to me, he turned to me, he says, don't worry about landing on the numbers. <laughs> we don't mind pushing it back. You got lots of runway, use it. <laughs> right? Um, now, the air cadet operation that also flies out of Brum, and I understood, was shut down that day because of the winds, because of the turbulent conditions. Okay, that's fair. You know, we've got, we've got low time pilots, we've got student pilots. We're comparing that to, you know, high, high, higher time licensed pilot, experienced, high, more capable ship. From the data, from the FLARM, the, 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 the circuit was described as sloppy and slow. It wasn't, it wasn't following that good, nice pattern. It was, we, we have the speed records, you know, as, as it progressed down. Here's what we saw. The indicated airspeed dropped from 60 knots to 45 knots. Now, this happened early in the downwind. So picture yourself. You've set up on a gusty, windy day. You've got 5,000 feet of runway. You're in a hot ship with flaps. You set up on your downwind, 60 knots seems pretty good. And then you drop to 45. What do you guys think? Yeah, not good. Somebody didn't account for gas. <laughs> well, here's the thing. He's really close to stall, but he's on his downwind. And at that point, for the next 90 seconds, minute and a half, he flew 45 knots. What's interesting, though, is the ground speeds showed his constant. So here's one of the potential possibilities is perhaps he got confused by some of that technology and he looked at the wrong number on the screen. We don't know. Well, and uh, it could also be that if you're close to the ground and with a tailwind that you mistake the ground speed for airspeed. Absolutely. So we get into if that. ground speed was constant, that's probably, uh, that may be. Uh, Potentially. Again, we'll never know. The point being, though, is there must have been 
the, the only thing that I'm willing to say on this is that there was a loss of situational awareness. He lost his situation. He didn't know what speed he was at because any good self-respecting pilot in that airplane, in that position, the second they realized they're at 45 knots, what would you all be doing? <laughs> Absolutely. Is there a question over here? I just had a comment, though. Um, that makes sense with the wind on downwinds. Yeah. Fast, yep. Except that it's a 90 degree crosswind. I know. So that's not really it's not kind of, it's not adding up, is it? Okay, in terms Paul? of your facts, because we're getting down this thing, when, what altitude was he at when all of a sudden it was doing 45 knots? It was early part of downwind. He was still at somewhere, I'd, I'd have to go and look at the file again, but. In a 29G, does it have a landing flap setting? It does have a landing flap setting, and when you, and when you pull landing flap, it's like an elevator, and you were coming down pretty steep, from I what I that. understand. I understand that the flap aircraft will pitch up, so if he didn't reach the airplane, when and that's, flaps, and that's another possibility, absolutely, yes, because when you add flaps and you're changing the, the angle and of attack. he loses attention, and he's going so back to Oh, but, but he did this for 90 seconds. Does it? Yeah. And at 27, 29, you don't go into landing flap until you're on final. You're on final close. But if he went into any lower flap setting, I'd go early. So, There's so, no noticeable pitch. Okay. So, so yeah. Okay, so thank you for, yeah? Um, the question, how, how was the indicated airspeed established uh, after the fact? Um, I believe the indicated airspeed was fed into the, the, the file. Oh, okay. um, I didn't do the analysis on this. There's a, um, a TSB um, uh, um, inspector who flies at Montreal. Pierre, Pierre thank you. <laughs> um, he did the investigation. And fortunate for us, he did a lot extra investigation than what's normally done. Right, because he wants to know from a glider pilot. So this is where I'm getting my data from. Okay, I, I'm with York on this, that the indicated airspeed, these are approximations that come from the software. The only thing the farm is measuring is ground speed. Okay. It's also measuring, it's calculating wind through the flight. It's applying that calculated wind to the ground speed to come up with an indicated airspeed. In the okay. So I, I wouldn't take those indicated airspeed numbers as gospel. Okay, fair enough. So, so what we do know for 100% sure is that he had a marked slowdown early on in his, in his um, downwind that was not corrected. Mm -hmm. Okay. There was eyewitnesses that saw, that said, that reported he was flying erratically and slow, yes. appeared slow in the circuit. Yes. <coughs> now, Sean? I only have one <coughs> question, and this is relating to the pilot in question. Was this for him a new aircraft? And what Third was flight in the SG-29. Thank you. And what was his previous aircraft of experience? Do we know that? Uh, he was speed. trained in a side-by-side -side motor glider. He, mm -hmm. In a STEMI? Yep. He was trained in a STEMI, side-by-side okay. um, -side motor glider, and he was a power conversion. Interesting. Okay. okay. Um, now, he was in a right-hand circuit, but he spun left. This is not the classic turn, base, final, stall, spin. As far as we can tell, he entered the spin from level flight. Now, how do we spin an airplane? How do we enter a spin? Number one, you have to stall that airplane. Here's the one fact I can tell you about this accident. That airplane stalled. Now, what's going to cause an airplane to stall? Of not airspeed, thank you. Angle of attack. This is key. What airspeed will you stall at? Any airspeed as long as you see that angle of attack. Okay, we need to keep that in mind. Right? Now, airspeed is, is often referred to as the poor man's angle of attack indicator. Right? Because as I have the higher speed, I'm going to have to be a heck of a lot more aggressive to get that wing to stall. But if I'm sitting close to that stall speed, with or without flaps, now you start oh, to add in some turbulence. Erratic flight, of course. Sorry, I didn't put the two together for the <laughs> angle attack. The erratic. So the we've got a stall, a spin left. He rotated about 1.5 times before impacting the ground. The ground impact suggests that he was no longer in a spin. The ASW29, or sorry, the SG29 um, from that club was tested at altitude, 
And their determination was they need about 540 feet to recover from the spin. And you're going to have about a rotation and a half to be able to do that. That is with an experienced pilot setting up for an intentional spin, doing all the correct things to get it out with no flaps. He was on base. So he didn't have the 540 feet. Now, you've also got the, um, the surprise effect. And we're going we're gonna to just explore that in a few moments. These, are the, these four traces are his four last flights. I did not check to find out if the other three were in the 29 or not. But this orange one here was the accident flight. These other three were previous flights. And the reason that Pierre wanted to look at this is he wanted to determine this pilot's habits. Now remember, safety is what we do repeatedly. It's our habits. So when you see a pilot who habitually does things, who habitually comes around that corner over ruttering his or her turns, who habitually has poor speed control, right? What we're looking at, we now have a vision of that future, or potential future. This is why we as instructors, we want that precision. Now, if we look at this from an aviation airline perspective, they fly by the numbers, right? They want that precision. You look at the traces. For those of you, we, we had a, um, a seminar at uh, SOSA where we had Scott McMaster come in and talk to us about um, airplane alley, like heavy, media, heavy metal alley. And he brought some, some pictures, traces like this, of the heavies coming in. And there is a thousand of these traces going in. And what you see is, is a bunch of lines, and then you see a single line. It's pretty thick, dark, but there is a single line. And it's amazing how precise they are. Now granted, they have additional instrumentation to help them with that, ILS and, and so forth. But when we, we start to look at that kind of precision, and ask ourselves, you know, how are we doing? Now, we don't have engines to compensate. So yes, we are going to have a certain amount of variation. Right? But we take a look at this last flight, and it is definitely deviating from the others. <coughs> so here we're looking at a pilot with reasonable precision, with reasonable amount of good habits, and there's the deviation. So what might have caused this? Now that we've taken a look at the facts, what might have caused this pilot in a very capable airplane? I was just thinking about the, the medical history, but fatigue may okay. have been... Uh, so let's start a category here, medical. And the first one is fatigue. What's making you say fatigue? By the way, if anyone has a whiteboard with spell check, I will buy it. <laughs> Spelling amnesty day. All right, fatigue. Why are you saying fatigue, Chris? Mm-hmm, absolutely. Yes, yeah, so maybe, maybe some, some, some fatigue. Yeah, absolutely. What else? For under medical. Do we know, um, was it hot that day? I, I don't know. So the question was, was it hot that day? Was it humid? I, I can't speak to that. I, I would have said dehydration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Definitely unprepared and insane because the man, although he brought three snack, four snack bars and 700 mil of Juice boxes. He consumed one juice box. Yeah. Only one snack bar. But let's not forget, hour. he planned for a half-hour flight. Right. So I would contend he actually prepared well for his intention, <laughs> right? Which was a half-hour sniffing flight. He ended up going for four hours. But I agree with you on the dehydration because it was a juice box, not water. Yeah. And the and the body consumes those very differently. Under medical, what else? Yeah. Bladder. Bladder. <laughs> yeah, so the opposite of dehydration, right? Very, Absolutely. Very so what, talk to me a little bit about that. So, I mean, he might have had a bunch of coffee in the morning and, and thinking, oh, I'm only going to go on a half hour flight. Yeah. You know, empty his bladder. And then I don't know if that uh, club squatter had uh, <laughs> a pee system, but, you know, he might have been holding it in or he didn't have and, it. And even if it had a pee system, was he set up for it? Exactly. Because yeah. you're expecting a half hour flight. 
How many of us have hopped in that, you know, that intro flight where it's like, ah, it's going to be 10, 20 minutes, you know, let's go, right? And you don't, you don't do the setup that you would do for a four hour, five hour flight, yeah? And you refrain of drinking because you will fill up your blood. <laughs> well, right, so, so we get both ends of that spectrum, right? Eh? Okay. What else might have caused that erratic flight? Uh, it was a very rough day. Okay. And uh, it was so, uh, fatigue was much more uh, intense. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you have uh, two minutes before landing, you say, okay, uh, I arrive. And uh, yep. usually the last minute you say, you know, you remove your attention, you know, say. Mm -hmm. So it was, I finally it was, came back. Right, it was described as the people on the day as a challenging day. He was sent to do a half hour sniff, right? So now he's had a challenging day. He's had four hours of challenge. We get into a bit of decision fatigue, right? So what else on the weather? Fatigue, but also mental fatigue. That's what I was saying, decision yeah. fatigue, yeah. Exactly. I would say, based on that last trace, he might have been surprised by his position relative to the runway. So what, what would have caused the surprise? Well, crosswind drift. So maybe we get into a little crosswind drift, right? There was definitely loss of situational awareness there, right? Because he was not in a good situation for a good 90 seconds before the spin initiated. In fact, he actually stalled, recovered, and then entered the spin. So there was a recorded stall before the actual spin itself. Based on the traces that you showed there, there's two stories that I wanted to comment about. The first one is, is What's the orientation of that? Is north south in this case? That doesn't doesn't matter, Sean. Your runway's on that angle there. Understood. I'm, I'm only bringing the fact that is he doing a right hand downwind coming into the landing strip, but his crosswind and or winds are coming out of the north and thus pushing him or drifting him closer to the runway than he anticipated. <laughs> That's why I said probably. Okay, so he's, he's undergoing what I would consider runway compression. And his trace, his last trace shows that he's compressing towards the runway. So he's really stacking up his odds. He's not giving Loss of situational space. awareness. Correct. Right? But the story, too, is on those other traces. He has this sort of meandering out and then come into the angle and at the last that's, minute for the final, take that, that sharp turn. Yeah, but that, that, that's not uncommon for the higher performance ships that want to do more of a circular circuit. Okay. okay? Um, with, with a defined turn on to final, okay? Um, you also got to remember that the traces, depending upon the data points, are going to, to, to change that a little bit. I would actually refer to how he reacted to being out of position. Oh, okay. So, you know, yes, he had lack situational awareness. Situational awareness, yeah. To get there. Mm -hmm. But then he finds himself out of position. Surprise. Oh, shit. Yes. Now what? Yes. And, and so then maybe he tried to turn left to compensate and get himself back into position. I don't know. Potentially. Or Again, just we'll, we'll never know. Right. right? The, other, the other thought I had when I first heard that he was actually spinning left and not right is did he get into an incipient to the right, do a correction, and put himself into a left? Because there is, of course, there is that possibility as well. So he's, his base leg is on, is, he's got, got a tailwind on base leg, right? So there could be some illusion effect there. Absolutely. The yeah. And really what we've got is we've got a really solid situation, loss of situational awareness. Now we start to get into all the detailed factors around what's going to cause that. Yeah? You put all it together, it sounds like overload too. Sounds like there might have been some. Yeah. I'm not sure he's got loss of situational awareness in the sense that if you look at where he turns to final, there's a natural yeah. progression of where he turns to final, and his trace apart from the last four seconds are exactly his headed to final, what does it get to final itis? He's trying to get here. to the turn. You mean here? He statistically would have been if this is his fourth flight. So if you come a little further, follow the arc of, yeah, he should be about, no, 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 it's a little, yeah, a little further on. So, so keep so in mind. trying to get to the fourth position of where yeah. he, Right? So he wasn't, so, my proposal was that, no, he was not disoriented or confused. He was headed very deliberately to the fourth spot after the three that he'd previously okay. done. So but it won't work. So from a positional perspective, I think you, you, may, you may be true. We may or may not, we don't know. But here's the situational awareness that he lost. What was his airspeed? He was flying too slow, right? He experienced one stall and then a few seconds later, and it was actually several seconds later, that's when he entered the spin. So that's the situational piece that he's missing. Right. And usually yeah. that occurs when you have any 
get something itis, get to their itis, Absolutely. get to their itis, your attention shrinks to that. Yes, yeah, so Everything we get into the tunnel vision, we get into the, the yeah, the, the totally agree. The, yeah. Because, and he would say, his angel might say, well, yeah, I, I got to my target, I just yeah. didn't achieve anything else. Yeah. Paul? Well, also the possibility, because he spun to the left, I mean, if he's slow already, and he's in a gusty situation, he's definitely in this territory down where he might, he might have been a climb attitude and spun the other way. Yeah. 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 But, so, and, but I agree with the situational awareness. I think he was trying to do the right thing. Maybe he was blowing. He pinched in a little bit. But his fundamental error seems to be he was slow. He was slow. And then nature took over. Either he didn't look ahead when he banked the plane, which is a fundamental thing down low. Because if you just look down the runway and lack of controls, is open to this. Or he got unlucky. In the well, if you would follow the, the arcing curve, he would have said about where the spin started. Oops, I'm I'm coming around right too far. I need to go to the left. No. Potentially, and then but he, uh, it, he he entered from the flat. So the ASW, yeah. I'm familiar with the ASW 27 uh, manual. I can't speak for this airplane, but it's probably very similar. There's a warning at slow speeds not to use maximum deflections yep. of ailerons because it can stall the wing. So he's got a gusty situation where there, we know there's a wind shear because of the different speeds of the altitude. So he's getting himself slow. He gets some turbulence. He's, he's likely to put in a full control input, which he's not supposed to do for right. the airplane. And it spins the opposite direction of his turn. That's, that's so quite possible. Let's think about how you could enter a spin in those conditions from level flight. What might cause you to enter a spin? Well, the first thing I just want to come back to it because his, his visual cues are telling him he's moving really fast. He's got a strong tailwind. Mm -hmm. He looks like he's moving at 60 knots or that. Right. So there's a loss of situational awareness because if I'm paying attention to my visual clues and I've slowed my airspeed to the point of, of that kind of danger, I have lost my situational awareness. We agree? What could cause you to, to spin at that point? And I'm going to put the caveat you didn't move the Cross controls. controls. Say again? Cross no, I'm going to put the caveat you do not oh. move the controls. You're flying along straight and level, stick centered, feet centered. Angle You're on the edge of stall in gusty Angle conditions. Angle of attack. Angle of attack, right? Now, what's going to cause a change of angle of attack on this wing versus this wing if I don't do anything with the controls? Wind shear. All he needed to do was have a good old gust do this to this wing, and you've now induced a spin. And but I but think. Also, uh, if, if he moves the controls. What I'm talking about, though, is if he doesn't move the controls, because yeah, what do we no. teach our students? Yeah. We teach them to enter a spin, you need to move the controls. Yeah, no, I agree with what right? you're saying, but, but also in this case. Uh, it could, have been, it could have been amplified by that, for sure. He may, he may have had a little bit of a gust and went to correct, and that, that induced the spin. Again, we'll never know. The thing that I did want to have come out of this conversation, though, and this was a bit of a realization for me, because I've been studying now wind shear and turbulence in this whole induced spin thing for almost a year now. Granted, it's been part-time. This isn't like my full-time job, right? <laughs> um, and, and one of the things that I think we miss on this is that all of the wind shear um, diagrams and discussions we have usually display laminar flow. Okay? And what we need to do is we need to be thinking about vertical wind shear, not just horizontal. Because what's the classic conversation that we have? As you're descending through altitude, the headwind becomes you know, less, and hence our, our airspeed you know, with the inertia change and all that. But the thing we don't talk about is what about that air that's bouncing up and down? What about when you come over the end of the runway and there's a, there's a ditch or a road or some sort of berm and that air is doing a little tiny mini wave? Or that copse of trees just north of the what, runway. Crater. Whatever that is, right? Now, if we're dealing with gusty conditions on a challenging day, and those were the words that were in the accident report of, of witnesses, you're sitting close to that angle of attack or that, that critical angle, you get a gust on one wing that doesn't on the other, or if you got a rotor that did this around this airplane, you're going to have an increase in the angle of attack here. You're going to have a decrease in the angle of attack here. You've now got one wing stalled and one wing not. Over the fence you go. Right? So what would you do to prevent that? Just simply to bear speed up? Thank you so much. <laughs> no, and let's, let's have that conversation. What, what is... 
What is, the, what is the defense of this? How do we prevent this? Monitor your numbers. Monitor your numbers. Fly a little faster. Now, now we're not going to use that formula, Sean, because that formula is only a general guideline in the absence of specific directions within your POA. Right? Your pilot operating manual, POH, sorry. So here's the question. What does it say in the, one tw in the 29 manual? Because we had a, an incident last year where the report said, I slowed to the standard approach speed of 54 knots to lower the flaps, and then all of a sudden I was pointing at the ground. I don't know how it happened. Guess what? Exactly the same conditions. Now that pilot took all of his, fortunately he recovered and landed safely, thank God. And then he did a whole bunch of investigation. But that one he slowed down to put approach flaps on. Yeah. Contrary to what the manual says, not to slow down the airplane. There it is. Now, how much runway did we have in front of us? 5,000 feet. Right? You've got an aircraft with, yes, it has approach flaps. It has landing flaps. And it says in the manual, do not put landing flap until you have made the runway. Because when you put landing flap, as described by the CFI from this club, when I had long in-depth conversations with him on this, he says, it's like an elevator. You come down. So this is not a ship that is going to drift you a mile down the runway if you have that extra speed. Right? Now, yes, we need to know our airplanes. We need to know the aircraft. We need to get comfortable with our aircraft. We need to know it in its different configurations. We do not have engines to compensate, so we compensate with airspeed. So on those windy, gusty conditions, we need to carry that extra speed. Okay? Spoilers become more effective with the, uh, gust, with the additional speed. Um, when I was flying in Pemberton, where I was on an L23, not very effective spoilers, and he said, pick up the speed, pull full spoilers, you'd be amazed. So I tried it. Right? Now it increases, what is it, by the square of the speed. So if you double the speed, you quadruple the, the effectiveness, right? Take your aircraft up to altitude, pick up speed, pull full spoilers, watch what happens. It's amazing. You got a question, comment? Hi, I just, just wanted to point out to you the two things that bother me here. Yeah. One is that he's in a constant turn. He's never giving himself a chance mm -hmm. to get relaxed with how he's coming at the airfield. Second thing is, he doesn't look like he's racing back to that runway because he went a long way so past the runway before yeah. he turned back in. So I'm not sure that's going on. But yeah. if he's constantly fighting that aircraft in a turn, the chances of making a bad judgment or not giving yourself a moment totally to agree. look at something and yep. check out to stabilize thing. your approach. Yeah. Totally agree. Yep, absolutely. I remember my training with David many times of David saying, buy yourself time. Yep. Increase your speed, increase your distance, and give yourself more time to size up what you're doing and gain that advantage of situational awareness. Um, David, do we know where the CG was on that flight? Uh, no, we do not. No, we do not. Sorry. <coughs> and and um, from what I understand, the CG was well within spec. It was on balance. Yeah, and I apologize, I had a video all queued up that I was about to show. So I'm just going to keep mumbling and rambling for like, you know, 30 seconds or so while I... Well, I have a, I have a question. Yeah, uh, go for it. Was the circuit normal other than what you see in the trays at the end or at the right altitude? Yes. Yeah, the circuit was pretty normal. Now, I'm going to show a video here. It's about a six-minute video. It's produced by the AOPA. And um, it, it is... I apologize. It is a... Um, it is a uh, power video. But what I'd like to do is let's take a few minutes to watch this. It'll only take about six minutes. Um, and what I'd like to do is when the video's done, I'd like to pose the question, what can we learn from this video that we can apply to our world of gliders? Okay. So obviously there's going to be a, a couple of things in here like power up and go around as an option, which isn't available to us. But let's take a look at, because I think this is a really good video. I think it's a really good one that, that demonstrates a lot of the, the good practices. And let's take a look at what we can apply to our world. Pilots begin practicing stall recognition and recovery before their first solo flights. 
They have to demonstrate those skills repeatedly on check rides and subsequent flight reviews. But year after year, unintended stalls are among the leading causes of fatal aviation accidents. Why? One major reason is that the stalls we practice in training don't look or feel much like the ones that catch pilots off guard. Also, pilots often fail to understand the implications of being close to the ground. Every time you fly, a portion of that flight is being spent in the red zone, basically an altitude that may not offer enough time or height above the ground to recover from a stall or spin. Let's look at the standard wings level power off stall. The deliberate entry and recovery that's taught to students is the most docile of all the stall maneuvers in the curriculum. And yet, this procedure is meant to prepare us for flying in the traffic pattern, where things can be very different. Compared to practice maneuvers, actual stalls in the traffic pattern are outright dangerous, and they come as a surprise. The shot slows a pilot's reaction but he's already at low altitude. Power's not likely to be all the way back to idle, and a lot of these occur during turns. If the bank's not coordinated, the airplane's likely to spin from an altitude that doesn't leave room to recover, even with perfect technique. Traffic pattern stalls usually result from some combination of distraction, poor pattern discipline, and sloppy stick and rudder flying. An eventual loss of control arises from an earlier of command, discipline, precision, and awareness are needed to disrupt that chain of events. The lower the airplane, the more the pilot's attention should be focused on the fundamentals of flying it. Knowing the causes helps to find the cures. There are a few simple things we can do that will help us keep command so we don't lose control. The first is enforcing a sterile cockpit. This means minimizing distractions during the high workload phases of flight, especially approach and landing. The airlines prohibit all non-essential activity or discussion below 10,000 feet. The equivalent for GA is the last 10 minutes before arrival and below 2,500 feet above ground level. Once you're in the sterile cockpit zone, have your passengers keep quiet unless you can enlist them to call out traffic. <laughs> you should also store any loose items you won't need before landing. Think of it as mentally decluttering the cockpit so that once things get busy, you'll be able to give full attention to flying the airplane. <coughs> the second thing the pilots can do to help eliminate lapses in airmanship is a stabilized approach. That means having the airplane correctly configured and at its intended altitude, airspeed, and descent rate, so that only small adjustments to course and power are required to cross the threshold with the airplane ready to land. But stabilizing the approach begins long before you turn final. Typically at each checkpoint, end of descent, pattern entry, a beam the numbers, base, and short final, you should have precise targets for airspeed, altitude, descent rate, and spacing from the runway. Make configuration changes the same points every time, and preferably wings level. Keep turns to a maximum of 30 degrees of bank, and pay attention to coordination. Keep in mind that there may be times when a one-size-fits-all pattern procedure doesn't apply. <coughs> you need to rely on using good judgment based on the surrounding environment. For example, flying into a mountain stream. In any case, find the specific values that work for your airplane. The goal is to aim small and miss small. Anything more than a modest divergence from those standards means that the approach is no longer stable. If there's any doubt, power up, go around, and try again. Quite a few pattern stalls happen while the pilot's trying to slow the airplane for spacing and traffic ahead. Any need to slow below normal approach speed or attempt S-turns, 360s, or other non-standard maneuvers is a clear sign that the approach isn't stable. If it's at the tower's request, don't hesitate to tell them, unable. Plan to go around with a sidestep if that's necessary to keep traveling in sight. Even after crossing the threshold, you're not home free. Come in too fast, and you might hit the nose gear first and bounce back into the air. This carries a real risk of damaging the aircraft. Flare too high and too aggressively, and you'll stall too far above the runway. 
Once the nose drops, there's a good chance it will touch down before the mains. The higher the altitude, the harder the impact. You might escape with just a hard landing, but botched landings have the potential to do damage to the aircraft. The good news here is that most hard landings are survivable, especially when everyone's wearing a seatbelt with a shoulder harness. Stalls from altitude aren't nearly as benign. The extra energy collected during a 50 or 100 foot fall vastly increases impact forces. More than half of these accidents are fatal, compared to less than 2% of landing stalls. The traffic pattern is not the place to worry about things other than flying the airplane and maintaining an adequate margin of safety. <laughs> Avoiding low power stalls isn't difficult, but it requires awareness and management of the airplane's energy state, just like every other phase of flight. Understanding the interplay between airspeed, angle of attack, altitude, bank angle, and descent rate enables you to maintain control throughout the approach. Strive for precision, attend to the details, and focus on flying the machine until it's down and stopped. Do it consistently, and the only stalls you'll ever see are the ones you practice deliberately. Okay. What do you guys take out of that video? Don't drop watermelons from height, yeah. <laughs> Apparently you're supposed to go around in that situation, Luke. <laughs> so what do you guys take out of that video? Be a boy scout, be prepared. Be prepared? Be consistent. Minimize distraction, be consistent. Now I want to address the be consistent, because I totally agree with you. But be consistent looks different in a glider than it does in a power plane, doesn't it? I have a question about Six. being consistent. Yeah. So, you know, um, when I first was uh, taught uh, gliding, yep. uh, it's told in the downwind, basically fly the same speed as base and fly. Mm -hmm. uh, subsequent few flights with, with other instructors over my career, people have different opinions about that. Some yes. think that you should be slowing down in the downwind leg because you have a tailwind. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I don't know if you have to talk about that. I, I personally do. Let's open it to the room first. What do you guys think? So the advice was slow down during downwind because you're going to have a tail when you're going faster. Give you more time. Is that paraphrased yeah. properly? I think it depends on if you're too low or too high to, in the downwind. You're going to adjust for it. And if you're in sync, you've got to speed up. If you're in lift and you're low, you can slow down a bit. But yes, but you should always aim to fly at the, uh, the speed that you want to land at, which is, depends on the wind conditions, okay. to get custom to it. Let's hear from Dave, yeah? Completely disagree. Okay, okay. talk to us, give us your opinion. You should fly best L over D on down. Okay, why? I believe it's outlined in the SAC instruction manual. Okay. Okay, but you should be flying best L over D so that you uh, have the best achieved distance over the ground on downwind. Okay. So that if you do have a 30 knot tailwind, you're not suddenly doing, let's see, if I'm going to land in a 30 knot wind, I'm going to approach at 70, so now I have to do 100 knots on downwind because I have my 30 knot tailwind, right? I have mm -hmm. my ground speed of 30 and my approach speed of 70, so now I'm doing 100. Versus a day when the wind is zero and you're doing 50 on downwind. So it's not reasonable to fly your approach speed on downwind. Your approach speed is selected once you turn base. I, I think we have another opinion, Paul. Well, yeah, this, this, is, this is an example of trying to fine tune things and then complicating control. Because the actual ranges you get in the speeds under your scenarios don't change things significantly, significantly in terms of the time you get to make the decision. Okay? And the more important thing is, as you get going down the circuit, is the less you fill with your plane and its configuration, the more can, you're consistent there the more time you have to make other more important decisions. And the problem with your approach is you keep fiddling with the plane, and all you do is, the time that you're spending fiddling with the plane is subtracted from making decisions. And you haven't changed the total time in your circuit significantly. All you've done is complicate your control and your thinking about controlling the plane. So to me, the proper thing is, at the beginning of the circuit, you go to your approach speed, and then that takes the simplicity, 
makes the controlling the plane part very simple. And you can spend more valuable time saying, maybe I have to adjust the circuit slightly. Maybe I have to go a little wider, a little things, but you can make those kind of decisions as opposed to plane controlling decisions. And that's the argument on the other side of the, of the board. And we have very short, compact circuits compared to power. Power have got a lot of luxury in that they're out wider and stuff, and it does make a difference, especially if you get faster and faster aircrafts, and changing your speeds has significant impact on the length of time in your circuit, and you have more time to make decisions. So you also have more time to make controlling decisions for the plane. If you're on a really big, long flight, yeah, you can go and adjust your speed and stuff like that. When you're in a glider, where probably your maximum speed range in the circuit is under 20 knots, all you're doing is complicating your life and taking away from more important decision making in the circuit. Dan? That, a lot of that has to do with the perspective you're flying at. If you're a cross-country pilot, you're usually approaching your circuit from your best L over D. Mm -hmm. There's no need to increase your speed until you need to increase your speed. Yeah. So that you get the best distance over the ground so you ensuring that you're going to reach the points that you want to reach. Yep. You start speeding up too soon, you increase your rate of descent, you may not reach the point that you want to reach at the right speed. If you release that toe at 3,000 and dive for the runway, then it really doesn't matter what, what speed right. you're coming in at. Yeah, but we're talking so, about once you're in the circuit, not once you're approaching the airport. If you're saying that you set your approach speed once you're in the circuit, you're doing your downwind check. You should, but yeah. you should be approaching and flying towards the airfield at your best LOD. You start your circuit as best L over D. You don't really need to increase your speed until you're at a beam your reference running right. toward. Right. But some yeah. before you're on fine. Yes. Well so, oh, before fine. Yeah, well yeah, before okay. fine. So one one thing that, that I would like to, to contribute to this is consistency. Because what speed you fly, if you're if you're going down your downwind and you're going down your base, and you're going down your final, and your speed is varying, let's say Let's put some big numbers on this, and you, you decide to vary it from, you know, 45 to 65. You put a big 20 knot variance on that in any airplane. You're not going to be able to judge your circuit. You're not going to be able to judge your landing. So we need to have some consistency. When we get into conditions where it's gusty and bumpy, we want to have some margin because the slower we go, the closer we are to the critical angle. We hit that critical angle, your wing will stall, period. When we start to dial in flaps, keeping the same attitude, that usually changes the critical angle. So, and that's hence why we sometimes see aircraft that, that have that pitch change, because with the, with the angle change and the, the increased drag, et cetera, we have to compensate for that because we don't have that engine. So let's have a, a final comment, then we're well, going to move back to where we go. Your best for consistency, uh, consistency is that trim lever. I mean, yes. if you trim properly, then you're not fighting the speed all the time. Yes. All right, one more. Go for it. Just one thing I want to mention, looking around the room, I can say it's probably safe to bet that most of us have been or are instructors. Quick, quick show of hands. Who is not an instructor here? That's <laughs> kind of... <laughs> <laughs> so, a little bit more. Okay. My point is, is we're, those of us who are training the next generation, we're yes. trying to train the correct habits, and the thing many experienced people forget is the people who are learning they don't have the automatic things like controlling the cough, the, the aircraft automatic to the level we make. We need to give those, as Paul said, we need to give those pilots the most time possible to judge. Stabilized approach, moving the controls as little as possible in the circuit is what gives them the greatest possibility of success in that approach mm -hmm. the entire circuit. Okay. You know, at what's a good thing back to the pre takeoff or pre landing check? Controls, instruments, straps, yep. trim, airspeed, most of that stuff, you should be doing that early in the circuit. If, if not, not before you hit high key. Not after you hit your reference point, yep. or your aiming point, because and that's what Paul said as well. Don't screw around below 1,000 feet. Yeah. There's and, no time. And, and think about your students who have entered the high key, they've entered the, the, the down one, and they start their downwind checks. Now, if they get halfway through by the time they're turning base, they're actually doing pretty good. But you take an experienced pilot, you've entered downwind, man, you can, you can buzz through swaths so fast, right? Because we've got the time and experience, right? So we've got to get some of those good basic habits in place. And here's what I, I made notes of while I was watching this video. 
first thing is the red zone. I love this concept. I've heard about this concept in professional flying. Now, 10,000 feet, I think if we set it at that level, then we're not having any conversations in the cockpit, <laughs> right? I don't know about you, but I've done a lot of flights that are less than 10 minutes and below 2,500 feet. Okay, so that number's out. What might make sense for a red zone for us as glider pilots? 1,000 feet, circuit altitude, right? Or, you know, maybe some of you maybe say 800, right? But what we want to think about is what is it going to take you to recover from that stall slash spin? But get rid of the term downwind checks. They're pre-landing checks. Thank you. Yes. Appreciate that. Yes, they are pre-landing checks. Now, the other thing that I took out of that, and I love this terminology. Say again? Pre-high key checks. You could call them pre-high key if you want. Pre-landing. Either one. Whatever works for you. It's about the discipline of when they're applied. Right? I love this term here, loss of command. Because we often talk about loss of control. In my estimation, from looking at the numbers, assuming that those, those airspeed numbers are reasonable, <coughs> right there, there was a loss of command 90 seconds before he entered that spin. We often term it loss of situational awareness. Who was flying that airplane? Wow. He may have been doing some inputs, but was his brain really doing the flying at that point? Or was his brain somewhere else? Yeah, a lot of people in the room know I broke an airplane once. And Thank you for sharing. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I have a point for doing it today. Uh, I've convinced myself it was dehydration. Yes. The accident caused be, uh, by flying too slowly. Yes. But the root cause I've convinced myself was dehydration. So I think a lot of this discussion about the best way to fly a circuit, we know in this case the guy did not fly fast enough. Yes. So debating about, well, what's the best way to fly fast enough, or how do we decide what's fast enough? But in this particular case, the fella uh, did not fly fast enough. As I say, in my case, I convinced myself I was dehydrated, and I believe what was going on was I was trying to slow down because my brain was not keeping up mm -hmm. with the world outside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when I look at this, Accident, I see loss of command. Yes. And one possible cause would be that his brain was simply not keeping up. Absolutely. And now, he was slowing the world down to match his brain. Beautiful. We're going to explore that after we finish the, the safety report. Um, if it's to build on that, can we park it till after? Mark? Max? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other one that I just wanted to highlight briefly stabilized approach. Whatever that looks like to you in a glider. Stabilized approach. Now, the stabilized approach version in a power plane is going to look different. They have, they have, we have engines to compensate for different conditions, et cetera. And I love their example of, well, you know, for example, if you're in a mountainous region, right? I mean, take off from hope. You're not doing a right turn. <laughs> There's a big old wall there. Um, but, you know, a stabilized approach in a glider, it may look different, you know, from one flight to the next, but it's stabilized, right? So we've got that, that more constant descent rate, that more constant speed, whatever that speed looks like. Even on the preceding flights, and to my eye, yes. it looks like with respect to stabilized approach, those final turns would have had to be more than 30 degrees. It's, they were pretty intense, I thought. That, that's kind of what my thought was, too, initially. I'm, I'm starting to gather uh, other ICG files to look at the actual turn to final and what the circuit looks like. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to be comparing that to a bunch of other stuff. I'm not going to comment on that at this point, though. Ratio. Say again? The 30 degrees that they're talking about in the video is for low aspect ratio. Yeah. High aspect ratio wings, you can go 30 to 45 degree bank is considered normal. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna shift gears now. Yeah. Yeah, again I would also say that the the, the, the circuit looked very tight. Yes, it and, did. Uh, talking about a stabilized approach. To make a stabilized approach you you need to have decent uh, final approach. You need enough space. Enough space. And yes. the, the approaches nowadays that I often see is um, uh, and flights with and two seats with instructors. Yeah. Where uh, they seem to fly by, by altitude numbers or by a certain tree or something. Yeah. And they, they uh, just squeeze it in and uh, land the glider so, and land. And so they're, here, they're here, not uh, a long, fine approach. Where so you here's, my, situation. here's my comment on that. We need to stop allowing it. So when we see it occurring, we need to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Because what's happening is we're allowing the habit to build. Yeah. Right? Don't, don't okay. Don't <laughs> We're now going to shift gears a little bit. Let's take a look at the other incidences. The first one is an accident. Side slip too low. 
This was a, uh, an aircraft coming in single seat, just trying to put it in on the numbers, did a, a low altitude side slip. The aircraft is known for um, becoming over aggressive in the side slip, so at a certain point when you get it cranked over, it wants to go more. And he did that at very low altitude. He managed to get the wings level in time, but not arrest the descent rate. Uh, the wheel was shoved up through the airplane, and we have a broken, destroyed airplane. Um, disturbingly, there were several other incidences of people landing short. Okay. Now, when we talk about precision, when we talk about good landing, it doesn't mean putting it on the numbers. I would much rather see someone come in with a nice, stabilized approach and hit halfway down the runway comfortably, safely, than putting it on the numbers. Right? We want to make sure that we're, we're, you know, we're, we're not being misunderstood by our students when we say we want precision. Okay? Um, I have a data point for you on short landings. Yes, thank you. We did a spot landing contest at Sosa last year. Yes. For the first time ever. We set the threshold 500 feet up the runway. Okay. More than half of the people landed short with spoilers wide open. Nice. Now, those half people, were they experienced or were they students? Both. Beautiful, thank you. How many people here do periodic spot landing contests at their field? Right? Okay. Might be a good idea to try that. Okay, so we have the same incidents with spot landing contests. Yep. Because it's where the wheel touched down. And a number of year ago, years ago, we changed the contents. So we could have sort of the same effect as somebody has. So we made it a, more of a precision landing contest. Yes. So we put cones on the runway, and the rules are you roll up the cone but not pass the score. Okay. And it took away, it, it put the fun back into a, like an a, a event, but took all this spot landing stuff where people are trying to put spoilers on and crush so, down somewhere. So it became sort of a, a landing contest that you roll up to a cone, and of course you've got all the same sort of things, yeah, yeah. and makes it a safer contest. So I have to share my story of that because at a club I was at, it was actually in Cleveland, uh, we did that exact thing. We had our corn roast and we did a, a spot landing contest. And we said, okay, it's going to be you know, where you stop. And some smart aleck in the crowd said, which part of the glider? <laughs> so we said, well, let's use the main wheel because it'll be easiest to measure. To which he said, which part of the wheel? <laughs> so we said, fine, smart guy, the axle. He rolled this far past the axle. We put a plate on the ground, we did a paper plate, we kind of stapled it to the ground. That was the mark. He literally put the wheel on the plate, but the center of the plate, oh, and that was the other thing too, which part of the mark, right? So we said center of the plate, center of the axle, and he went like literally six inches past. The tire was still on top of the plate. So yeah, it's a, it's a really good fun contest to do. We measure with uh, yarn. And the winner, you know, gets yeah. the shortest string in the end. They get a string. Nice, love it. All right. Um, the next one, the next one, folks, was a gear up landing. Here was the scenario. Glider took off, released from the toe, never retracted his gear. So guess what he did when he did his, his pre-landing checks? He retracted the gear. There's a great example of loss of situational awareness. That's a, that's a training error. Mm -hmm. The person was trained to cycle the gear. He's not trained to look what he's doing. Right. Pictogram that he's got the gear in the right position. His situation so was he thought do, the gear was do down. what you do in practice. Absolutely. What you're just yes. to do. If you're just cycling gear and you're not paying attention to which way it's going. Totally agree. Yeah. yeah we so we want to make it very active thought process, not just a I move my hand. I did the exact same thing in 2002. Nice. Thank you for sharing. Appreciate that. I did the exact same thing in 1986. <laughs> <laughs> I still own a fixed gear airplane. <laughs> now I'm trained. Yes. I have a combination of gear up and first flight on time. I was in the final, yeah. and just before I was going over the threshold, and fortunately it was a grass field. Yeah. I, didn't I looked at uh, the gear and I thought, oh, shit, I have to put uh, the... Yeah, I haven't lowered it. Lowered the gear. Yeah. So I moved, moved the handle. Yeah. I moved it up. Nice. <laughs> All right. Um, we also had several incidences. One, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Just to speak to the comment about instructors teaching people, and I, I'm only a little bit of a troublemaker, but yeah, yeah. I've been making for some time without breaching the rules of the club. The post release check. You should check. Yes. The rope is gone. You yes. You should check your yes. gear. You should set your um, 
computers on. You should have your map ready. You should do, have your water ready. Do all your stuff after you, you release. Have a good look out and then set off on task. It's yep. only three or four things. Yes. I'm not aware it's in any of the SAC or not. It, it actually is. Cement. Yes. Well, it I is. I must have missed it in my training. It's, it's the, the acronym is URL. <laughs> release, right turn, retract, retrim, locate the field. It's URL. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. All right, we had several that were first flight, first flight on type. Sadly, one of them, unfortunately, was, was two days in a row. He did his first flight on, did a, did a landing that had an issue, did a second one, did a second landing that had an issue, broke it on the second one. Um, yeah. Ground handling systems, we talked about that one, designed 20 years ago with lighter ships. Uh, lots of equipment failures, a bunch of battery stuff. We also had several guest issues this year this past year. Uh, you know, crossing the runway, walking in front of airplanes that were taxiing, crossing over the rope on a, on a winch that, that was hooked up, that sort of thing. Um, and, and of course, runway incursions. We, asked, we had a premature release. Um, the, uh, the pilot in the back seat asked the guest in the front to do something, I think switch on the vario or switch off the vario or something, and they pulled the release. Uh, we'll do that in a minute. OK, okay yeah. Um, other incidences, we had lots of close calls with heavy metal. Great movie, awesome music. <laughs> Don't want to be meeting it in the air. Um, and this is, this is outside of, of Heavy Metal Alley, just up by Tososa. Okay, so we're seeing this in Gatineau and Quebec in, in, in uh, Ottawa area. Several canopy opening flights this year. I got a, an email early in the season. Dave, what are your stats on canopy openings? I was like, hmm, don't really know. Dan, what are your stats on canopy openings? Hmm, don't really know. Then I went through this year's and it's like, I think we had five or six. Boops. Yeah. Hmm? Pooks. Don't remember the types. Sorry, it wasn't all pooks. What? I think one there was at least one pook. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Here's the thing though, and, and I was looking at a, another safety seminar slide deck from a club in the States they shared, and they said, you know what? It's not the canopy opening that causes the accident. Mm -hmm. What causes the accident? Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're trying to close it. The, the reaction of the pilot afterwards, mm -hmm. right? Can your airplane fly with an open canopy? Yes. Yes. Right? Can fly the plane. Fly, fly the plane. Should also be yes. Fly the plane. Period. Yeah. Okay. That is your sole task. Uh, we lost our canopy on our on our uh, Jantar a couple of years ago. Um, it, it, Classic, you know, chain of events, but he basically took off with it unlocked, flew to altitude, released, flew a nice flight, came into the circuit, lowered the gear for, for circuit, and <laughs> <laughs> so all of a sudden he's like this. <laughs> and, you know, the immediate, oh shit, oh crap, oh what? And then he said, you know what? All I heard was your voice in my head saying, fly the plane. And he did an absolutely perfect circuit, right? And Tom was behind him in, in a two seat trainer watching the canopy do this. <laughs> we found the canopy, the guy felt so bad he polished the snot out of it, we have a nicer canopy now. <laughs> All right. Uh, spoilers open on tow. We had a few of these happen this year. Um, fortunately, all of them were dealt with nicely. Yeah, nice. Um, Lighters take off without the elevator connected. We touched on that one earlier. Um, pulled the release at 250. Talk to us about that one. Oh, yeah, that was uh, the guest intro flight? Yeah. So it was in the DG-1000. Oh. No, sir. Yeah, yeah, guest pulls, yeah. yeah. In the DG-1000, the uh, intro flight um, guest was in the front seat. The pilot had briefed the guest on basic controls and uh, what the stick did and the radio button and everything else. And the DG-1000 has a switch for the vario to switch between climb and cruise on the front of the stick. And it's only on in the front stick. And so after they took off, the volume, the vario was exorbitantly loud. So the pilot in the back said, can you click the little switch to the back position? And the um, guest in the front had said, oh, you mean this little, and the word that was missed was yellow thing, <laughs> which was the important detail of the day. And then so the instructor in the back said, yes, the little switch, and they missed the yellow. So the student guest intro goes, boop. <laughs> and the pilot is wondering why the yellow rope is falling away and the radio is still clicking on <laughs> at the same volume. And then immediately, a few seconds later, Jim lowered the nose and made a couple of the right hand turns and made a safe landing. But I think it was done because they, um, they overbriefed the, the student on all of the controls and what they did. So they, they kind of knew 
what this did, what that did, what this did, and everything else. So, you know, they if they had just left it alone, they said, let me fly the flight, and then when we get up to altitude, if I tell you to do something, then we can do that there. So it might have been a, a case of too much information right Yeah. They, that, that's a concept, and we always talk about sterile cockpit in yeah. landing and everything else. What we're horrible at is sterile cockpits on takeoff. And I, I've done that with students to hammer that in. We've gotten up to like three, four hundred feet, and I did it to one student, and they went and closed the vent on the canopy. We were at four hundred feet. And I pulled the release. Right. Nice. Right? Because if it's a little noise annoyance in the varial, you can live with it on yeah. at a safe altitude. Yeah. Right. Then start mucking around. Right. Uh, same thing. I just remembered York's uh, lecture, and it, and it struck home. Don't screw with anything on the first four hundred feet of a yeah. snake. Crawls up, just ignore it. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, some, some good advice. Ignore what's going on, right? You know, fly the plane. Um, what I loved in the in the incident report from the the 250 release is the pilot admitted it took him several seconds to figure out what the heck just happened. Right. right? And then right. It was because there was no audible. Yeah, there was no clunk. Like you know, whenever we practice rope breaks or anything else, mm -hmm. you're doing winch launches and everything else. There's always an abrupt bang. Now we need to do something. Yeah. This was just flying along at this. And it, it, it kind of let go and, and went on its way. I think it's a good training exercise to um, make a, um, a rope break yes. with a silent. Yes. Because we know how to do that, right? Yeah, yeah. It's not beyond our capacity. Yeah. Right? And even when the, and the students are usually somewhere between yeah. stunned and overwhelmed. And, and even when the student's happy. flying, all you have to do is just watch for that little slight bit of slack and just, just quietly click it. Yeah, I've even got a couple of instructors that way on their spring checks. Where is he? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, glider enters spin, low simulated rope break. It's the number one thing with a rope break. What are you supposed to do? Lower the nose. So they did the rope break, simulated low, and what happened? The student pilot did one of those. Fortunately, the instructor was quick on the mark and got the airplane back under control. Um, tow plane entered a spin, boxing the wake exercise. Went a little bit too far. Let's back up a minute. Yeah. A the instructor was too slow, and that's why he entered the spin. The instructor should have been, as soon as the nose started to come up, he should have been pushing the step forward. The problem was is that there was an experienced pilot in front. And oh, okay. A very experienced instructor in the back, and he, I, was, he was a little overconfident because he didn't expect to didn't get those details. do the wrong thing. So when he raised the nose, he said, well, he's going to lower the nose. Right. And then he banked. <coughs> okay, thank you for that, because I, I hadn't heard those additional details. I could give you the, the, the view from the ground. <laughs> Dan, Dan actually hit it, and this comes to the complacency. Yes. Of, uh, two instructors flying together. Mm -hmm. and I remember early in my career, I said, most of the thing is two instructors yep. flying together. And I've had that with, you know, Atlantic all of a sudden accelerating, and I was flying with an instructor and said, why are we at 80 knots? I said, I don't know. Why are you at 80 knots? <laughs> we get very sloppy with you yes. have control, I have control, yes. or like you said, Dan, believing that person knows what they're doing. And Absolutely. Saying, Whoa, you know. Yeah. I actually took off in a Cessna 172 with no one flying. Yeah. So I had, a, I had a pilot buddy of mine. I was just a glider. He was like, hey, do you want to do some of the flying? Yes, I'll do the takeoff. You do the landing. It's like, okay, cool. He'd taken over during taxi, turned onto the runway, firewalled it. Didn't say anything. I assumed, oh, I'm going to do the sterile cockpit thing. I'm going to just let him, right? We get to about 50 feet. The plane does this. He goes, I have control. <laughs> <laughs> what? I said, I thought you had it the whole time because he never handed it to me, right? And, and, you know, he was also a fairly new pilot. Like, he wasn't an instructor. He was a fairly new pilot. So, yeah, so we had a conversation about that. Ever since that, I am absolutely fanatical about who has control. Yes. Yes. All right. Canopy opens on takeoff. Right. So we have them an opening on tow. We have them an opening on takeoff. Um, what can we do about it? Sorry. Just one. I'm just thinking of. There was uh, a few years ago. There was an advertisement. Uh, I think for an insurance company. Yes. And there were uh, two pilots coming to the field. Yes. And, uh, yes. Yes. I, I. You know what? I have that somewhere. I'll see if I can dig it up yeah. for for after break. Yeah. yeah. It's brilliant. All right. What can we do about it? Pretty big question. Paul. Well, we, we, we've had a number of these incidents. And <coughs> one of the things we get into with uh, soaring and gliding and flying in general is we're very solitary. We think it's our only responsibility. We're the pilot of the man. 
and I talk to people about checks all the time, and some people have better checks, and oh, my check works. Everybody is very skillful, but they're by themselves. And so what we said, well, if you go and look at other safety industries, they often do things in pairs. In the airline industry, you know, one person flies, one does the checklist. And we're deficient in this. We don't, we don't take opportunities to have two people checking, which is part of the reason why our elevators don't get hooked up and things like that. And we're very independent about it, too. And this is a change for us. So we instituted a wing runner checklist. So the wing runner goes through the checklist with the pilot, the pilot confirms. And the only strength of this, it doesn't matter, you come up with your own checklist. You know, I, I don't care, you know, you can debate what's a better checklist. But it's somebody else, the wing runner, initiating things with the pilot command. So if they get distracted or this or that, or the other thing, you go through and say, Cockpit check. Straps secure, can't be yep. closed and locked. You know, Se second pair of eyes. Spoilers closed, the second pair of eyes. And that's the whole idea yep. with this, is that the second pair of eyes. And, and, and we're not good at this, so I'm saying if you can find other things where you can interact, I think this will help with some of these safety concerns. Yeah, Cr critical assembly check is another really good one because well, that, that's the whole, you know, and, and did I connect my elevator? With Tom Knopf, the critical assembly yep. checklist. And why? What's the value? You know, if the value is you could go and say, well, somebody else doesn't know how to assemble my plane, but that's not the point. It's not you right. could go and say, well, did you put the, and they can show you, yeah, well, here's how you put the elevator on correctly. It's not a case of the pilot not being responsible anymore. It's the second set of eyes going yep. through the list. The yeah, I buddy list, yeah. The yeah. I buddy list, sure. The yeah, I buddy list by Tom. Let's, okay. Yeah. What else can we do about this? Great, great suggestion. Get the second pair of eyes. What else? Practice on the ground. Say again? Practice on the ground. Practice on the ground. Um, I actually, I, I was doing a session earlier this week and I used a video of skydiving. They do this thing called dirt diving. Any skydivers? Dirt diving? Yeah. So they did a formation of 400 skydivers in free fall. 400. It's a world record. And guess what they did is they all lied on the ground and held hands. <laughs> right? Because they're simulating it in the air. And then they all stood on the ground and some guy in the center threw his hat up. And half of them turned around and walked away. And then another hat went up. And then another half turned around and walked away. And then a third hat went up. And the third half got up and walked away. Yeah, I know there's three halves. Um, but what they were doing is they were practicing not only the formation itself, but they were practicing how to break away from the formation. They went through the whole thing on the ground. If you've ever watched an air show pilot, what do they do? They stand on the ground and they do this. And you'll see four of them doing this with their hands all together. And they're all walking around. Because what they're doing is they're practicing what they're going to do on the ground. Right? Now, our sport lends itself to not practicing because we have to have a lot of creativity in the air because we don't have an engine, right? We have to have a lot of, hey, I want to go over there, but oh, look, the conditions are over there better, so I'll go that way to get over there, right? So it's hard for a young pilot who wants to institute that discipline and institute that planning on the ground. But we as instructors need to model that, right? We as senior pilots need to model that because here's the thing. I can plan to have a three-hour flight. I'm not sure exactly which direction I'm going to go, but I plan for that three-hour flight. Right? Then we have to ask ourselves about you know, how, how we deal with those changes in the way, in the air. Oh, sorry. This was the point where I was going to show the data. <laughs> so a uh, couple things I just want to finish up on. The safety report is we're going to take a short break, and then we're going to come back to do a, a session around neuroscience and safety. Um, the dialogue. With the safety officers, last year I committed to doing that. Um, I have been slow in getting that started. I'm going to up that commitment. We're going to be having a virtual dialogue across the country. We need to increase the awareness. Ourselves, our club, SAC in general, look for the articles in free flight, do the posts on, on SAC.ca, get the conversations going. Uh, my favorite incident, glider released on tow. Why? Not sure they're going to clear the obstacles. It landed without incident in the soybean field. Initially, they rejected the scout tow plane. There were two pilots aboard doing a checkout. It was a high density altitude day. You're looking at this going, why is this a favorite incident? Because the tow pilot convinced them to go. Who's pilot in command? It means that the tow plane, what I understand is the tow plane came up and they said, no, I don't want the scout, I want the more powerful tow plane. But then the tow pilot convinced them to go. 
You are in command, folks. It is your decision. Anytime I'm flying with a low time student and a wing goes up, I ask them, was that you? No. And, they say, and then I say, who's flying the plane? Because it ain't you right now. You are in command. Okay? It is your decisions. So, to close this off, excellence is an art won by training and habituation. We need to not only train to become pilots, we need to train to continue to be pilots. Our license is not a license for recklessness. It's a, it comes with a heavy responsibility. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is not an act, it is a habit. If we keep good discipline, it will pay off. Can I add one more thing, only because it's an observation on some of the data that you presented so far. We have both incidents that are in the air, which are airmanship, but we also have what occurs to us as pilots on the ground, whether yep. it's ground handling or what have you. I think we should be more vigilant of what occurs when we aren't flying because we justify it through normalization when we shouldn't. We should fix our I mistakes we make on the ground. And, and, and that I'm actually seeing in the accident reports, that awareness is, is increasing because um, the first two rounds of accident reports that I, that I dealt with were very much in the air. This last round, there was a lot on the ground. People are recognizing the fact that, that this, this is a bigger conversation than just after our feet leave the ground. We're not, we're not just piloting our planes behind the tow hook, behind the tow plane. We're yep. piloting our planes behind the tow car. So let's take a short break here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, one more. Uh, Comment, uh, and I, I think we should not be reluctant yes. to uh, ask a pilot to, for a dual flight. If okay. we uh, observe flying that we think requires a dual flight to make sure that, uh, that it can be that it is I, 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 would, I would absolutely support that. Um, there is a reluctance to do it. Th there, there is absolutely a reluctance. There is also a reluctance to call out bad behavior during our spring checks mm -hmm. because that person is a higher time, maybe more senior than yourself type pilot. Um, I remember being extremely humbled uh, when I went and checked out a pilot who was much, 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 much more senior than me. And after we landed on the spring check, and he did it beautifully because he was just a master, he turned to me and he said, how was that? And I said, uh, fine. He says, no, really, I want to know. And he seriously, honestly, wanted to know. And this was a man with over 6,000 hours. He was an ex-fighter pilot. He, was, he had diamonds and golds and all kinds of stuff. He had world records. And I, at the time, had 150, 200 hours. Uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> but he honestly, honestly evaluated himself.